With me now is Mayor Mark Gamba of Milwaukee, who plans to fight for the Democratic nomination for representative in Oregon's 5th Congressional District, making the announcement. Uh, Mayor Gamba, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Okay, so for voters who don't know, who is Mark Gamba? I'll let you answer that any way you want. All right. Well, let's see. I'm uh, a progressive mayor from a blue-collar city, uh, mm -hmm. the city of Milwaukee. Um, I'm a father. I'm a... Uh, had a small business for 30 years, and I'm a photojournalist with uh, clients like National Geographic that's uh, afforded me the opportunity to see some of the rest of the world and what's happening there. You were first elected mayor of Milwaukee in 2015, right. re-elected in 2018, and before you became mayor, you served on the city council there. So Correct. why try to make the jump to Congress, and, and why now? Well, why now? Gee, that, those are two big questions. <laughs> Uh, why is because, frankly, uh, you know, the sort of status quo millionaire politicians that are currently in D.C. are kind of out of touch mm -hmm. with, with the problems that, as a mayor of a small town, we see every day, yeah. right? Um, I've had people who I've scrambled to try and find them housing when they were losing their housing either due to no-cause evictions or big rent increases. I've had uh, conversations with homeless people who were living on the streets because um, some health issue they had cost them everything they owned. You know, uh, we were dealing with climate change. We have, um, you know, a bridge that washed out, or at least footings that washed out that mm -hmm. we had to replace uh, due to extreme weather events, due to a, a record-setting storm. We've had uh, the smoke. Uh, the last couple of summers, worst air quality in the world here mm -hmm. in the Pacific Northwest, right? And those are issues that, that uh, we're not seeing the politicians in D.C. De deal with. Um, I, you know, I, and, and boiling it down, I don't think anybody who's working a full-time job or a full-time job and then some should be living in poverty, do you? And yet, that's the state of our country right now. We have millions of people that that's exactly what their life is. And uh, that goes back to the federal government. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, over the last, whatever, 50 years, my life, you know, when I was a kid, you, uh, one parent could have a decent job. Not a lawyer or a doctor kind of job, but just a decent job. They could buy a house, they could buy a car, they could pay for their, the health care they needed, they could maybe go on vacation every now and then. Think about today. If you're not a, a family that has two wage earners and pretty good jobs, you're not buying a house. And that's been a steady you know, thing that's happened. And it, through that same sweep of time, the millionaires and the billionaires have been being taxed less and less and less, and they are reaching levels of wealth that have never been seen before. So we do have a, a Democrat representing that district right now, Representative Kurt Schrader. So why should Democrats vote for you over Mr. Schrader, Congressman Schrader, in the primary? Well, I, I like Kurt. He's a nice man. Um, and I tried to work with him for a lot of years on various things. And, and he always said nice words, nice, you know. He always, he always makes nice sounds about whatever it is he's talking about. But then he doesn't necessarily vote that way and he certainly doesn't put the effort into um, solving those problems. He's not gotten out front on climate, he's not gotten out front on, on uh, health care. What is the most important issue facing people in your district right now? Jeez, um, it's really hard to pick because it, it kind of, right, right now, it's, it's uh, the inability for, for a lot of people, inability to afford housing, it's, um, and, and that then expands into all the things, right? If you're in that situation where it's, your housing is so expensive, you're choosing to not do other things like pay for health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those things kind of go together. But I think as a mayor, and certainly as a congressman, we need to be thinking about not just what's happening to our people today, which it, climate change is happening to them today, but what, what's it going to be like in 30 years, right? This is a problem that we have 11 years to solve. 
if we don't solve climate change in the next 11 years, the effects will be irreversible. We won't have an opportunity to fix it after that. So that's a pretty short time span. The federal government has known about this for decades, and they haven't done anything. It's, it's really time to have a Congress that understands the science, that um, is willing to do the kinds of things that it's going to take, and that has the backbone to stand up to the fossil fuel industry. So you did talk about several priorities already, including this one. Would that be your number one priority if climate. you had to pick one? If I had to pick one, climate, yeah. Uh, that's, why, that's why I ran for office in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but health care is really close on its heels, and, uh, and solving the issue of the, of the middle class becoming poorer and poorer and poorer has got to be, I mean, if that's not even good for the economy. If you're, if you're straight up, you know, all about the economy, all about profits, having a poor middle class does you no good. Mm -hmm. They can't buy your products. Maybe your answers tie into this next question here, but why do you think 2020, the 2020 election, is the time to push harder for things like a Green New Deal that we've heard um, from the Democrats or Medicare for all from some of the Democrats, I should say? Why is this the time to push hard for those? I think there's a lot of reasons. I think, uh, well, like I said, 11 years, mm -hmm. right? So on climate change, it's either get in the game now and really do it, or we, we're not going to be able to fix it. So, you know, 10 years ago was the right time to do it. Now is <laughs> an even more right time to do it. Um, healthcare, I think, I think we're now seeing enough Americans understand that um, a Medicare for all would probably serve them better than what they currently have. Um, I think we're going to see a pendulum swing in the next election, that uh, sort of an anti-Trump pendulum swing uh, that could actually bring a president into office, bring uh, a, a shift in the Senate to uh, a Democratic Senate, and bring more progressive people into the House so that they are trying to tackle these problems and doing it aggressively, not the same status quo solutions that they've been, you know, tinkering with for decades. So you just asked about this pendulum swing. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because you, you really believe that. You think this is going to be a swing away from um, President Trump. Obviously, you know there's a wide field of Democratic presidential candidates out sure. there. Is there anyone that you're supporting right now or are you waiting later to make a decision on that? I haven't gotten it narrowed down to one. Uh, there's four that I am liking. Um, I've known Governor Inslee for a while, and I have a lot of respect for him. Mm -hmm. I think he's a very practical guy. I think he's, he is the only guy right now that's focused on climate, that that's, that's his issue that he's pounding the table on. Um, I think Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are, have been for decades, but certainly are now talking about the issues. We have a very divided country mm -hmm. right now, right? There's this real polarization. And, it, and yet, if you go sit down, go have a beer with anybody, whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, and you talk to them about their family, you talk to them about their issues, the, the middle class and the poor, which is, let's call it the bottom 90%, have more in common with each other than they do with the 1%. That's really the divide. And you know, when, when Sanders started talking about that during the last election, during the, the run-up, he was the first presidential candidate that I actually ever heard say those things, to really draw people's attention to the fact that, look, your lives are not great, and this is why. And it could be changed. Um, and that's, I have a lot of respect for that, and I know a lot of, there's, all kinds of stuff, but so I like the two of them, and I'm intrigued by uh, Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete um, getting a lot of attention lately. He is getting a lot of attention. Getting some momentum. And as a as a fellow mayor, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a there's a there's a there there. He, he, when you've been the mayor and you've had to deal with potholes and sewer pipes <laughs> and roads and police shootings and all the things that mayors have to deal with, real world things that real world people have to live through. And you go to the grocery store, you're talking to your constituents, mm -hmm. right? 
you go to the bank, you're talking to your constituents. You are on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with real people. And there's a practicality that comes out of that that I think some politicians never had because they were never at that level. Yeah, we'll see how that presidential primary plays out. Obviously, it's a wide field right now. Sure. It would be considered an upset if you beat uh, Kurt Schrader in the primary. Now, <laughs> it did happen with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in her primary in New York. That district was a deeper blue than the one here in Oregon. And so no one was really worried about going it going Republican. So yeah. does that worry you at all that the majority here is slimmer? Do you feel like there is a chance that this district could flip? in Oregon. No, and it doesn't. And, it, and it's, you know, what I just said a few minutes ago. I, I don't think, um, I think when you can sit down with people and you can talk to them about their actual issues and the things that they're concerned about, you know, away from the noise they're hearing every mm -hmm. day, but what actually concerns their families, um, there's a lot of similarities. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a millionaire. I'm, I'm one of them. I'm part of that group. I have an empathy and uh, an understanding of what their issues are and a, and a willingness to frankly stand up to uh, corporate money. I'm not going to be taking any corporate PAC money. Um, and the reason I've decided to do that is not the showy thing that you know some politicians are using. It, it simply boils, boils down to human nature. When somebody has helped you mm -hmm. a lot, right, you have a little softer spot in your heart for them. You, you are going to take what they have to say a little more uh, to heart than just somebody walking in off the street. And I don't want to have that relationship with, with the corporations. I want to have that relationship with the people. Speaking of the people, wh what do you think, and, and I know you just touched on it a little bit, but what do you think is your, your appeal would be or could be to non-democratic voters in this election, non-affiliated, independent, and or Republican? A mixture of all three, I guess. Sure. Um, well, I've had a lot of conversations out there, and when I talk to people about their representative, uh, they all just kind of shake their heads because they're they're not seeing any action from him. So I think there's an opening there. Um, I think being a practical problem solver, being somebody who's been the mayor of the city of Milwaukee for four years, and I don't know how aware you are, but Milwaukee has shifted quite a bit in four years. It's uh, becoming a pretty amazing little town. and. Um, I'm not going to take all the credit for that. I had an outstanding council. We had great staff, um, and we had you know the, the light rail line, which certainly was um, created some impetus. But uh, you know, I've had I've had a good run, and and I think that's a, a proven ability to make decisions that actually benefit people. So we are talking to you a few days before your campaign launch event is when we're uh, doing this interview. It's also your birthday, though. So it what's is. the significance of that to you? Well, I knew I wanted to announce this spring um, because I'm serious about winning this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the primary opponents before didn't start until a couple months before the, before the primary race. I'm, I'm serious about it. And so... Um, I wanted the time to be able to run a, a, an honest to God campaign. And I started thinking about, okay, what, what day should I do it? How should I do it? And then I just went, God, you're turning 60 on April 19th. That's kind of cool. Let's, let's, let's throw a big birthday party and announce on, on your birthday. And then of course we filed with the FEC and it kind of got leaked out because of that. So um, it's not a big surprise to anybody now, but it's still gonna be fun to kick off the the campaign that way. Well, happy birthday to you. Thank you. Say. Mayor Gamba, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.